Hello and welcome. My name is Paloma Lopez. I am an educator at the Indian Arts Research Center with the School for Advanced Research. Thank you all for joining us today for the third of four events in this year's Native Arts Speaker Series, Grounded in Clay Conversations. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are all gathered here today on Tewa lands and are surrounded by the traditional lands of Pueblo, Apache, and Navajo communities. Both the Grounded in Clay exhibition and the events of this series speak to deep-seated connections between Pueblo people, land, and pottery. If you've not visited the exhibition yet, I urge you to do so before it leaves at the end of May. And if you have visited it before, I encourage you to revisit it and view it through a new lens informed by the knowledge and experiences shared by, with us today by our incredible speakers. Thank you to Mayak for hosting this year's events and to everyone here in the SAR who have worked so hard to make this series possible. And I have just one more bit of business before I introduce today's speakers. Um, as you're leaving here today, please consider filling out a survey from the city of Santa Fe. They are examining the impact of the arts on the economy. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming today's speakers, Diego Medina. <laughs> Diego is an artist and writer from Las Cruces, New Mexico. His artwork illustrates intricate metaphors that combine cultural knowledge and ancestral wisdom with fantasy and poetics. Do Diego currently serves as tribal historic preservation officer for the Piro Manso Tiwa tribe. Thanks for coming, Diego. Of course, thank you. Jerry Dunbar is Leda del, del Sur Pueblo. Oh. <laughs> Jerry is a traditional and contemporary potter, bead worker, and plains and Pueblo style moccasin maker. Thanks for coming, Jerry. Thank you. And Albert Albidres. Oh. <laughs> Albert is a former governor of Isleta del Sur Pueblo and a tribal potter, artist, historian, pottery collector, mentor, leader, and community activist. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Wonderful. Wow. Looks like a good crowd. Um, th yeah, thank you all for coming. This is such a, ooh, there we go. <laughs> um, this is such a wonderful opportunity. I mean, all of the conversations I've been able to have um, with these two very knowledgeable um, artists, friends, relatives. This past couple of years for this project have been amazing. And so I wanted to open this presentation up by just really sharing my most reverent gratitude for both Albert and Jerry mm -hmm. for, for all the things they've shared with me these past couple of years while collaborating on this project. We've had so many good and fun conversations. Um, and thank you for all my relatives and family who showed up um, today. Oh. All of Albert's <laughs> relatives and family, everyone that came out, um, and all of you, of course. Um, we're here to talk about the untold Pueblo stories, which we're not going to talk about all the untold Pueblo <laughs> stories, because there are so many of them to cover. But I think the three of us here were invited specifically to talk about um, what the heck happened in the Paso del Norte borderlands region, um, specifically after the Pueblo revolt and how that diaspora led to all three of us being here today as who we are. Um, you know, when we think about the history of New Mexico and the history of Pueblo, New Mexico, you know, the story often gets cut off right there in the middle um, at Albuquerque. And, you know, the rest of the story south of Albuquerque doesn't really get the time to shine, even though it's such an incredibly complex and nuanced story to tell. And our communities in the Borderlands region who carry on the legacy of, you know, the Puebloan world from south of the center of New Mexico. We have so much to share about, you know, the rest of the Puebloan story. Um, the Pueblo world at one point extended from the Colorado Plateau all the way down into Mexico, near Casas Grandes, Mexico. And there's a vast um, interconnected constellation network of Pueblo communities that shared gradients of cultural exchange and influence with each other. And the Pueblo revolt was really that, um, you know, fracture point in the his historical process of Native New Mexico that created the disconnect between all of the Pueblo communities across the region. However, despite that point of impact in the historical timeline of New Mexico, our communities in the Borderlands region continue to carry on so much of the important stories um, and cultural practices that were present during that time in the Pueblos of central New Mexico and further south. Um, 
So to clarify, I know a lot of you probably haven't heard of our communities. Some of you have, I'm sure, but we're often communities that um, people don't know where they are or how we got there. Um, Isleta del Sur is, of course, in Texas, and our Piromanso Tiwa community is in Las Cruces. And when I say Piromanso Tiwa, I'm talking about all three of our um, tribal cultural um, lineages that came into confluence after the Pueblo Revolt. So in 1659, a couple decades before the Pueblo Revolt happened, the first mission was established in what is today the El Paso Waters Borderplex, and that's the mission of Guadalupe. It was Guadalupe de los Mansos, or if you want to know the full name, it was Nuestra Señora de los Guadalupe de los Mansos, something so and so, right? And um, that was established in 1659, and it housed, of course, all of our Manso ancestors, as well as Tiwa exiles from the pueblos of Tajique and Chilili in central New Mexico, 22-ish Piro families from the Pueblo of Abo, and a few other um, Pueblo families from the, the nearby Conchos, um, Suma, and so on, communities of northern Mexico. And like I said, a few decades after that, the Pueblo Revolt happened, and subsequent to that, the rest of the Pueblo communities were established in the El Paso del Norte borderlands, and that included, of course, Isleta del Sur Pueblo, um, Socorro del Sur, Senecu, um, Guadalupe, San Elizario, San Lorenzo, and so on. There, these were major um, Pueblo communities that housed a lot of um, both exiles and refugees, as well as indigenous people that were already living in the Paso del Norte area. So for me, I'm a descendant of Jose Maria Manso. So my family is Manso, and um, we're you know, indigenous to the region known as the, the borderlands area. So the area from Doña Ana all the way down to Juarez. And um, of course, we have cultural influence from all of our Tiwa and Piro ancestors that married into our families. But for me, I think one of the most important stories that I'm here today to share with you all in regards to this story um, of untold Pueblo um, histories is this unique story of the rest of native New Mexico. And so when we think about the tribes that were part of um, you know, the cultural landscape of New Mexico, we have all of the Pueblos in northern New Mexico and of course the Diné and Apache communities. But um, you don't often hear about the Piro communities and even less so you don't often hear about the Manso community that was um, living in southern New Mexico. And so I think for me, it's really a special opportunity to get to share um, some insight into um, where, where we come from, who we are, and what it means to continuously um, get to live in an ecological and eco-spiritual relationship to our homelands in southern New Mexico. Um, of course, the Pueblo Revolt was that moment of impact that really created hemispheres in the state culturally, but the legacy that lives on throughout the entire state based on how um, our communities stay together is so important. And so with that, I know we're gonna lead into some really important conversations, but we can move over to the next slide. I think we can, let's see, what do we got? Yeah, so on the right we have a map of those, um, those Pueblo communities I was talking about that were established around the time of the Pueblo Revolt. Um, so we have Guadalupe, Santa Cruz, Socorro, Isleta, and then there's a couple others listed on there. And so these are the villages that were established for all of the Pueblo um, people living in the Paso del Norte region. And it's really important to understand the Borderlands region because there's such an incredible amount of history in tow um, that is connected to um, our villages and our people. And that includes some of the most important archeological sites in the area. Not only do we have the site near Peña Blanca where they found one of the first examples of cultivated corn in the continental United States, but we're also closest in geographic proximity to the oldest archeological site um, in um, the United States, which is the White Sands footprint site. And that's a picture of my hand next to some of the footprints. Um, <laughs> and it was really cool to get to go out there and, and see that site, which is from, from where I grew up, depending on how fast you drive, about 45 minutes to get there. <laughs> um, and it's so important, I think, to put this into context when we're talking about where we come from, because despite being the communities with the closest proximity to these incredibly important sites, we're also the communities that often get overlooked in the story of New Mexico. 
And um, there's something really poetically hilarious about that, but also just it's a really important time to get to um, share these stories and to get to bring to light um, who we are and how long we've been in relationship to these um, ancestral sites. With that, I'm going to pause and pivot and let Albert and Jerry do a little bit of an introduction as to who they are and um, a little bit about their villages, and then we'll carry forward into the conversation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, Dai. My name is Albert Alvides, and I'm from the Pueblo of Isleta del Sur. And as uh, Diego was mentioning here, our village um, is pretty much unknown to many New Mexican families that study Pueblo arts and culture. Um, the history stops at the border, but in Pueblo communities, there's really no land border that separates us. We're all pretty much connected to the vast landscape that exists. Isleta del Sur Pueblo resulted as a, the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Some historians will tell you that we volunteered and came down with the Spanish. Other accounts will tell you that we were brought as captives, and then there's the in-between. And so, as Diego has mentioned, there's been a presence um, in our area um, of, of interaction, of living, and of culture and community. And so our Pueblo is the last Pueblo to really get recognized as of this point. Um, we're located in a complete other state. We're at the tip, uh, route on the outskirts of El Paso, uh, that touch Las Cruces, New Mexico. But um, we have ties linguistically to the Tigua Pueblos of Taos, Picaris, Sandia, and Isleta Pueblo. Um, our ties are tied to Isleta primarily, but there's a couple of examples of um, interactions with some Jemez families and various other Pueblo cultures that also went down through the migration to what is now known as the Soto del Sur Pueblo. We uh, are a federally recognized Native American tribe. Uh, we refer to ourselves as the Tigua Indians or Isleta del Sur Pueblo. Our brothers refer to us as Weisleta. Um, <laughs> so there's different names that uh, kind of define who we are, but our culture and our traditions and practice have survived all this years, for many years. All the Pueblos get to interact with one another. They intermarry and they show similar um, cultural and religious attributes with one another. Isleta del Sur Pueblo was kind of left all on its own. And over these 300 years, we still maintained our traditions and our customs and our culture that define who Pueblo people are. So when you evaluate Native American tribes as a whole, you say, well, well what, what's different about you? Well, we have a different language. We have a different culture and a custom that makes unique to who we are and our traditions. And our cultural ceramics or our pottery um, normally get classified as El Paso brownware. And so when you look up at historical accounts, they kind of dismiss our presence. Um, so it's very difficult. We are producing utilitarian ware, so they're not really beautiful with the designs and the intricate work. It's always just utilitarian ware. Um, that's used for everyday use, religious use, ceremonial use, um, and just everyday household use. So they break and there's a lot of El Paso brownware in the catalogs that are not attributed to any of these uh, communities that comprise us. Where we're situated, we had the Pitos and the Mansos that lived there as well. And so as their communities got smaller, uh, um, for example, San Lorenzo moved over to Socorro and then Socorro moved over to Isleta and then everybody came to Isleta del Sur Pueblo. And so we have a lot of those uh, family ties as well. And there's a couple of families in our communities that we can trace our, our belonging to some of these Pito communities. Um, my, through my matrilineal side, uh, on my grandmother, I'm a Pais, and that's a Spanish name, but that's tied to the Pito communities. And so I have Pito heritage in me as well. Um, so we observe our traditions there. Um, in the late 80s, we became federally recognized through an effort. Uh, we had governor from Isleta Pueblo come down, visit with our elected leaders, and uh, we had to demonstrate why we were unique, why we were Isleta. We had to display our Isleta knowledge and uh, share with these uh, dignitaries that had come down to see if there was a similarity or a connection, and they quickly realized in our old village, known as uh, Barrio de los Indios, um, that we were Isleta. 
And so they assisted us in gaining support with the All Indian Pueblo Council, having all of the Pueblo sign on to our petition. Isleta sponsored our work and uh, we petitioned for federal recognition that was reached by the United States government. In that process, we face a little bit of challenge. Nothing's very easy, right? So everybody thinks that this is a success and that this was very important, which it was. But Congress kind of took a little extra nudge on us and put additional factors. When tribal communities petition for recognition, you have to you demonstrate that you have a culture and a tradition that is unique to you, that you have a form of government that you have observed, that you have leadership, and that you have laws that govern over your communities. And so when we did all of those things, we, we met the characteristics and they added on. They said, okay, we're gonna recognize you, but Congress will be in charge of your tribal role. Very interesting, right? So when you look at reservation system in life, um, tribal communities set membership criteria. It's based on certain components internally. Here we had a complete total body that was going to decide who we were and would be able to add us if we were not added up and down, if you were like lateral. If your brother was on the roll but your sister was off the roll, your sister couldn't get added by the Pueblo, they had to petition Congress. And so that became a problem. And so our role got a little tighter and it got a little small. And so families were a little split. But we continue to continue with our practice and our customs. And so it's required us to go before federal authorities and things and ask for support and assistance so that we can self-observe and, and determine who our membership role is. And so I say this because it's, it's an important element of who we are as a tribal government. We have the laws that govern over us. We have our heritage and our traditions that we observe and follow. The land base that we control as our communities and that we call home um, was limited to 66 acres and it was a sporadic checkerboard type. So you were on the reservation, you were off the reservation, you were on the reservation, you were off the reservation. What we find ironic is that even our Isleta mission, um, which we built in 1682, it doesn't belong to the Pueblo. It belongs to the Diocese of El Paso. Okay. In order to get to it, you have to use the roadways that belong to the city and some belong to the state. And then there's our village. And so we interact back and forth. And so many will not understand the dynamics and the complexities of all of these things, but you have multiple people claiming ownership to certain things and that limits uh, use and traditional knowledge of, of our tribal communities, but we persevere and uh, we continue to exist. These are some of the examples that I share with you that demonstrate how Isleta del Sorfor kind of had to overcome in addition to being isolated, in addition to all these things to maintain our traditions and our culture. And so some will say that we have lacked a lot of our traditional knowledge, that there's things for us to grow, that we should uh, you know, re-energize certain things. But I will say that we're very proud of our community because we preserved and maintained our identity despite all of these obstacles. As time has passed and we have the internet and we have all these social technological gadgets and things, the youth are now being distracted. And so what you find is tribal communities today are having to face what we faced many years ago. And we're an example that we can continue to survive. And so by being here today, being part of the Grounded in Clay exhibit, having some of our cultural ceramics inside the exhibit is a tremendous demonstration to our tenacity and I speak to tenacity, I love tenacity because it demonstrates our ability to continue and persevere. And so being part of this exhibit has been a very special moment for me. I am a potter, but I also am a historian in my own way, not by title or official uh, schooling, about our histories and our heritage and so when we were asked to be part of this group and I was able to find cultural ceramics that I could include and incorporate, um, that has been a tremendous opportunity for Isleta del Sur Pueblo as a whole, not for individuals, but as for our nation. And so in that, for right now, um, that's my introduction. <laughs> Jerry? My name's Jerry Dunbar. I'm a citizen of Isleta del Sur Pueblo. I am Tiwa, 
and like my cousin, uh, my have ancestors that were uh, Piro um, from the, the village of Senacu del Sur. Um, I like to acknowledge our ancestors, our predecessors, all those who came before us because they, through their suffering and their ultimate sacrifices, brought us here to, to, to today that we continue and practice our traditional ways, our ceremonies, our everyday customs, everything that makes Pueblo people who they are, we're here. And that's because of their tenacity. Thank you for the word. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Uh, but it's through their sufferings, their knowledge that has been passed down from one generation to the next, uh, from the dances to the ceremonies to, to our, our everyday life, to our pottery that you know, instill that creativity, that nuance, that continu continuation, and with our, especially with our clay mother, all the prayers that go in to the gathering, the processing, the prayers that are said as you're making the, the pieces, uh, the, the designs, the slips, uh, the firing, and a piece is not considered a, a live or until, or what we say born, until it has been fired and has survived the firing. These are the traditions that are passed on, that knowledge that bring us here to today, that we as Pueblo people still exist in all our communities. And that's the knowledge I'm grateful for to our ancestors, our grandfathers, everyone who has suffered. Uh, also because little is not just said, but Isleta was brought down twice. There was two ways of captives. Uh, everyone just mentions the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, but in 1682, the Spanish were trying to make uh, a re-entrance and reconquer northern New Mexico. They stopped off at Isleta, they captured it, forces of the northern villages were coming down, the Spanish uh, found out they burnt Isleta, they burnt all the supplies, anything that was in storage, and returned back to uh, the El Paso area, to our village, with an additional 385. So there's, there were more people coming in, all the other villages uh, that were south, uh, especially like the Piros, had already been abandoned. Uh, so there was no one else because, as Diego had mentioned, those that were able to escape and relocate, like from uh, Tajique, Chilili, uh, those that survived Coray, had already left and had made their way south. Or uh, there was one village uh, that during the early 1640s, 30s, 40s, where Pueblo people had actually relocated to, of all places, Kansas. Guatelejo, Kansas, and there's room, Pueblo rooms there. And this is because of the, the Spanish intrusion into our way of life. Our friends, our families, our relatives that had been trading partners with the Southern Plains people became and started to raid our villages because we could not longer trade with them because we were supplying any excess or whatever we had to do uh, or grow because we had to supply uh, the encomiendas for the civil and the, the, the religious. So we were already suffering at the hands of them and whether we could grow the crops or not, they demanded and would raid the, our villages, our storage houses, so that they had what they wanted. Um. So in this next slide, there are um, reference points to where a lot of these villages that Jerry is um, talking about were and were and are. And so when we think about the Puebloan world, um, of course, I tried to start this conversation by expanding the vision of how we look at the Pueblo landscape and really seeing the Puebloan world in its full um, capacity and what it um, and how it was um, set up to be 
all along, of course, the Rio Grande, but then there's also, you can see this trail of scattered dots in the 50s over here um, on like the central eastern side of New Mexico. And Eastern. that, yeah, that's all the Pueblo communities that were part of, I just dropped keys, that were part of um, the salt trading route that was incredibly important for maintaining um, life ways um, for, for every Pueblo community. And so the salt beds, of course, were right there in the appropriately named Salinas Pueblo Mission System area um, near Mountain Air, New Mexico, a little bit um, out of, outside of Mountain Air. And all of these communities were strategically and advantageously placed along that route so as to um, um, effectuate a commerce system based on the salt trade. And so the, so on there, the salt trading route linked so many different Puebloan communities together linguistically and culturally. And you'll see here, and a few slides down, you don't have to change it yet, but some of the pots we put up an example of, I have an, I have an example of a, a pot that was um, collected at um, Gran Quivira, but the, the materials for the pot were from Pecos. And you can see there's a direct line connecting these central New Mexican Pueblos straight up to where um, the Galisteo Basin would be. And so we can understand that there is these, there's multitudes of trading routes based on the geographic landscape. When we think about the landscape um, as an ancestor, we have to think about the formation of the land and how the shape of the land um, pretty much informs the placement of communities and the trade routes therein. And so all of these community placements and all of these trade route routes were communicated with us or to us by the landscape. And when we think about um, the, role of, the role of language, um, all types of language, you know, humans, we have various faculties for expression, which is why we're, we're people that get to practice and participate in ceremony because we can sing and dance and talk and a whole bunch of other things that we can do. But these faculties that, <laughs> these faculties that we can um, incorporate into our relationship, into the ecosystem, are all um, linguistic expressions of how we understand our place in the ecosystem. And there's that sense of communication backwards and forwards between the landscape and our villages, the placement of our villages, that informs the culture. And, you know, when we think about culture, culture is, you know, our way of incorporating these human faculties um, into um, various modalities so we can um, give back to the ecosystem. And it's their reference points and their access points for um, you know, experiences and knowledge that's passed down generationally. And so we have all of these systems and all these Pueblo communities, and this by no means is a complete map oh of all the Pueblo you. communities that were in central New Mexico. There were so many Pueblos throughout the area, and the Puebloan world was so vast. And understanding the story of Paso del Norte, the exodus that took place southward, into um, the borderlands region and all of the subsumation that occurred there in the Paso del Norte Pueblos that created cultural um, synergies of, of different people living, to, living together is so important for tying together the rest of the story of New Mexico as a whole. And so when we think about all of New Mexico, um, we have to understand that all of New Mexico is connected to this legacy of, of Pueblo and cultural expression, um, not just you know, in northern New Mexico, but all the way through. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think there's even some more maps. Yeah. And so we can see these different um, linguistic families here on the left. <coughs> and so like Jerry was articulating, we have the different Piro linguistic families. And then, of course, um, the Tiwa linguistic families and all the other language families of northern New Mexico. Um, and so it's a really beautiful, um, story to look at. You know, when I was, um, the reason I included that, that photograph of the White Sand site when I got to go out there a couple of years ago is because not just being at the footprint site, but um, right before you get into the site where there's the footprints, um, there's um, a, a bed of pottery shirts, just thousands of pottery shirts scattered there all about. And you see all of these different pottery expressions there on the ground. And so you have, you know, northern styles of pottery, you have Pakime, you have Mimbra styles of pottery, you have El Paso brownware pottery. <laughs> you have all these different <laughs> styles of pottery scattered there um, right next to this site. And although they're from different um, timelines entirely, you see how important it was for people to come 
and to meet in this area through time and to celebrate culturally or, or share culturally in this area. And a lot of that's related to the salt trade route that connected, of course, um, the Salinas um, area of New Mexico to the Pueblos of the North into the plains and then all the way down into Mexico. And so you have this system of commerce established that went in every direction. Um, you know, at one point, Paso del Norte was one of the most indigenous places in the continent outside of Mexico City by the numbers. It was incredibly populated by so many diverse communities of indigenous people. Not only the tribal communities that we mentioned of our Piro, our Monzo, and our Tiwa ancestors, but also, you know, a vast array of different um, tribal communities seeking exile and being um, invited in to live with us in our, in our Pueblo communities, and our mission communities. And um, that created such a unique cultural expression. That's the result of, of course, the Pueblo revolts and the exodus that I mentioned, but also all of these different um, historical um, um, points of impact. There was other revolts that happened, of course. There was the Casas Grandes revolt. There was the Monza revolt that happened in El Paso. And all of these <coughs> inform how we understand these, these shifts in culture and, and identity taking place. Um, what do we got on the next slide? I actually don't even know what's next, but. Um, I don't know if Jerry, you or Albert wanted to talk about some of these other communities that um, were so important to understanding the Puebloan world. Just that the un understanding of what is or wasn't a Pueblo is that within once south of Albuquerque, it becomes a way of void of Pueblo people, which is not true. And this was just an example of how the different Pueblo villages, Piro villages, Tompiro, those villages on the eastern side of the Manzano Mountains going into the Salinas into the Southern Plains existed. It was not a vacuum. People lived there, dwelled there, grew their crops there, and conducted their ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're t as we're talking about the dysphoria, dysphoria began when the Spanish came into our land. It just didn't happen in 1680, as, you know, but it's the major revolt that happened. But ever since they arrived into our, our land, villages upon villages were always fighting uh, against the oppression that was caused. And the various revolts, uh, if you, uh, throughout the times, the Southern Tiwa uh, revolted in the 1650s. The, the, uh, the Salinas provinces banded together to overthrow the Spanish do domination. And one of the ideas that they had, and there was more than just the three villages that are on the national monument list, um, was to cripple the Spanish mobility by letting the, their horses go so that they would have more of an equal balance in, in fighting as what would happen is there was fighting, the cavalry would come in with their spears and butcher the people. <coughs> so their idea was to let the horses go, band everyone together and rise up against them. That plan didn't quite happen because they were at trying to get work with uh, the, the villages of the Rio Grande to help with this overthrow, and that didn't happen. But the Salinas villages did, and of course, Spanish re retribution is merciless, and entire villages were destroyed, hundreds were slain. Those that were able to escape, escape. Those that couldn't, women and children were s sold down or taken to Mexico and um, sold as slaves, never to come back. And so these were things that led up to the final revolt of 16, well, the, the, the more noted one. But even after that, there were still uprisings, revolts against the oppression of the Spanish. 
Yeah, when we think about the history of revolts in, in the area, I think it really highlights, I think it's working too well. I think it really highlights <laughs> uh, an interesting component of what it means to look at the Pueblo diaspora, which is the perspective of eschatology, right? And understanding these um, different iterations of community and cultural expression as a result of the historical process. And I think to clarify, it's important to also think about history, not just in the traditional linear sense, but really understanding history as kind of an adumbration of the future that is pulling us forward. When we think about the way um, time is structured in a, in a ceremonial sense, it's structured towards, it's, it's structured in every direction, not just in towards the past, right? And so when we think about history being that adumbration of the future that's calling us forward, you really understand what I mean about this, this, this period in history specifically being such an eschatological moment, a moment of having to <coughs> reconcile with the end of something and whatever's to, 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 to follow that. And so I think that, um, you know, all of these villages, while they, you know, they still have, um, you know, living descendants in all of this diaspora we're talking about, and of course, in who we are today as communities and as individual people, you know, they're, in terms of their historical presence or their historical, um, their place in the historical narrative, that, that I think that's why we're truly here to talk about them, because in order to understand the full political scope of who we are as Pueblo people and as indigenous people, it's important to also make sure that there's um, those um, spaces made within the history of New Mexico for understanding that there is so much more to the Pueblo story than what's been um, taught or talked about in the majority of um, the historical storytelling of, of N native New Mexico. All right. Go to the next slide. <laughs> All right, here we go. So yeah, so these are the pots I referenced a little bit earlier. Um, the pot on um, your all's left. Um, Jerry, do you want to talk about that pot a little bit? That's one of the ones you selected. Oh, this, yes. this piece is a canteen from the Gran Quivira uh, village with the symbolism besides the eagle feathers and the four directions, but it also has uh, the ancestors, the, the, the abuelos, the, the spirits of the village. And it was one of those pieces that you, for me, it, it speaks to me for it. And in this exhibit, one of the ones that, uh, that I selected for the gathering of clay was an older piece, but from the same area. It's from the, the homelands at, that represent who we are. Yeah, and this pot that I placed, oh. Sorry. No, you're fine. This pot that's placed next to it was the pot that I referenced earlier that was found in the same er area, but all of the materials came from the Galisteo Basin region. And so it's connected to that story of, of commerce that existed on that route that goes from straight back behind um, the Manzano Mountains all the way up to um, the northern Tiwa Pueblos. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and so here's a, an additional map of um, our communities and the, where they're located now in comparison to some of the other Pueblo communities that um, are current um, sovereign nations or some of the historical Pueblo communities in the same area. And so you can see all of those different trade routes that existed on either side of the Rio Grande. And then here, I threw this in. Um, so this is the document that um, was signed in 1751 by Governor Kachupin, it's not the entire document, it's just a snippet of it, but this was the document that granted um, lands to our tribal people in the Paso del Norte area. And so there was a grant of land um, given to the Tiwas of Isleta uh, del Sur, and then of course given to our Piro and Monso communities as well. Um, and all the other Pueblos as well. Yeah, and all the other Pueblos, yeah. So that's, 
an example of that um, land grant document from 1751 that's an important part of the history of the borderlands because aside from the establishment of the missions in 1680, it wasn't until 1650, uh, 1751 that um, we received those um, leagues of land that would um, make up what were our historical, um, the historical boundaries of our nations. Next slide. Oh. So with the, with the documents itself came canes, and these are the canes of authorities that are found in all of the Pueblo villages today that grant us the authority to govern over these uh, areas of land. And so every Pueblo tribe maintains those today that received those um, canes. Wonderful. And so now we get into our pots. So this was one of the pots that I selected um, for this exhibit. And I just also want to mention that, like Albert had already um, emphasized, I want to reiterate how special it is to be a part of this project. Um, you know, for our tribe, we're, we're the tribe with the longest pending petition for federal recognition out of any tribe ever. And so it's kind of, it's, Kind of a cool history, but also kind of like, a, okay, it's weird. Um, but to be p included in this um, exhibit um, alongside all of the other Pueblo communities and get to share um, this story and get to have a space to be once again invited in um, with the rest of our um, Pueblo relatives to take part of this is so special. It's, it's so incredible to get to, you know, um, talk about you know, these other two tribal ancestries that exist as part of the story of New Mexico, the, the linguistic and cultural families of our Piro and our Monso people. I know when, when we mention all the tribes that existed or exist in New Mexico, I've heard exhaustive lists of people mentioning, you know, the Comanche presence, the Kiowa presence, the Ute presence, you know, all of these different Humano, all of these different tribes that existed in, in New Mexico and to be, um, you know, someone who gets to now come in and, and give voice to two of the tribal legacies that aren't often ever talked about, which is, of course, the Piro story of New Mexico and the Monso story of New Mexico. It's so incredibly important and, and special for me. And so this jar um, was a jar that actually was in the uh, ARC collection. And, and I, I used to work at SAR, and so I got to see the pots in the collection all the time. And I had never noticed these pots. There was a few pots that came from the Las Cruces area um, until one day, I believe it was Alicia, who was like, yeah, we got some pots from there. And I was like, what? Like, what do you, what do you mean you got pots? <laughs> and so this was one of the pots that was, um, the label is a, is a Tortugas jar, um, but um, this, this piece of pottery stylistically um, incorporates the Monso and of course the Piro design work that was very common in the, uh, Paso del Norte area, and it um, is given a date of around 1910, but the provenance of this um, pot, from what I gather, is actually a little bit um, more murky, as is most provenances of, of pottery you'll find. But um, the what's important is that stylistically it's a reflection of who our people are um, and how we carried on um, this, this um, tradition of pottery making despite even after our migration into the Doña Ana area. And so when the Doña Ana Bend Colony Grant opened up in um, the middle of the 1800s, around 1849, um, our tribal families um, took up land, plots of land in the Las Cruces area and migrated to Las Cruces. And so there was, of course, the displacement from the Pueblo Revolt that occurred, and then there is a, sequ a sex second su subsequent uh, migration into Las Cruces in the 1800s. And so we moved around quite a bit. Um, but our tribal story um, is, despite all of these different um, movements, you know, looking at a pot like this is, is really powerful because it shows um, how much um, our ancestors were holding on to um, even during all of these um, different movements. So this pot was actually um, found somewhere in Las Cruces, not necessarily in, um, you know, in a specific area of Las Cruces, but it was traded in, I, I believe, like, when I saw the notes, it was, like, took to Mesilla or something and then sold to a family somewhere else. And you know how the story goes. It got traded here and there and ended up in a museum. And so to, for, to be working at the same um, institution that had some of these pots, I was like, wow, this is so cool, because I had only ever seen 
photographs of pottery from the area, really. But then to get to um, see this piece and get to write about this piece and use it as an opportunity to tell some of this story, it's, it's a powerful thing. And I'm, I'm really grateful that this pot happened to be there. Um, and, and, and give, you know, the pots that I chose, they really are the reasons I, I have the opportunity to be part of this project and to tell this story. And so I think when we look at all of the, um, you know, confusing twists and turns different timelines take, there's always that mystical component that brings things back to where they need to be. Um, there's this saying, some, my mom's side of the family is like Irish. There's this saying that like, I, th I'm gonna, I might misquote it, but, um, you know, in Ireland, they always say that like poetry forms at water's edge, something along those lines. And I, I always think that's such a special way of understanding the way things to get, come together. But because when we think about the way water moves and is responsible for moving things and bringing things to where they need to be, and we think about poetry being our linguistic interpretation of the world around us, it really makes a lot of sense that things travel around and find their way, their place where they need to be at water's edge. And so. Um, I think that despite all the different movements that have occurred with these pots and with people and stuff, we always end up finding out where we need to go back to or where we need to be. What's next? Whose pot's next? And this was, this was the other um, little pot I decided to pick. It, was, it just really spoke to me. And I think, um, you know, getting to select a piece of pottery that like came from the same region that Jerry's pot or pot came from. It's just really special for telling that story of central New Mexico and um, that part of our ancestry as well. There's so much more I can say about this pot, but I definitely want to <laughs> jump on over to who's it, whoever's next. Next, yeah. So Jerry, that's you. This is, Jerry. This is the pot I selected because it's from a, um, the village of, uh, or it's, it's referred to as uh, the um, Pueblo Pardo, but it's from the Salinas area. It was close to Guelosa uh, uh, Gran Quaray, uh, or Las Humanas as everyone, mm -hmm. uh, it, it goes by several names. But it was a piece that was found there, and it's mm -hmm. one this was one village, one of 20 villages in the area that had survived. And <clears throat> as a result of the primarily years of drought, because the villages in that area relied on catchments, there wasn't a consistent water source where you had the river that was constantly flowing. They had to re rely on the, the catchments. So this piece represents that area. And that's when I, I have been to SAR so many times. And when I was asked to participate in this uh, two, three times a week, nothing caught my eye, nothing spoke to me. But this one time, all of a sudden I walk into the vault and there it is. It says, I'm here. And I says, I, thank you. We'll, we'll visit more. <laughs> <laughs> but within this pot, we were lucky enough to actually hold it in our hands. You feel the spirit, that essence within it. You feel the insides, you feel the, the fingertips that formed it. And for me, that was a direct connection back to our predecessors who struggled and survived to ensure our continuity here. What has it been used for? That I couldn't tell you. There's, some are ceremonial, some are uh, for food, some are containers. Uh, can't tell. This is the bowl that I chose. And so this particular bowl is utilitarian in nature and was made by, we even know who the maker was, um, the late Juana Ortega Munoz, who's from Estado del Sur Pueblo. So, in the 1880s to the 1920s is the date of this bowl, and that's when Juana kind of 
produce pottery on the outskirts of the village, all the local communities would say that there was a lady that would make pottery and things. And so you hear all these stories, right? And that she would put them on, on ox carts and they would go into Mexico and then the ox cart would come back and there'd be grains and flowers and things that would be traded for. So it was a form of commerce in addition to religious and traditional use as well. And so when I came to the vault and I got to look and see, this bowl stuck out because I'm fortunate to be a potter and uh, we make these similar bowls. And if you come to our feast day, um, we serve communal style. And these are the bowls that sit at the center of our tables that hold our food for all of the visitors that come. Mm -hmm. And so I was drawn to it. And so as soon as I touched it, I mean, we made a connection. When I looked at all of the province that's attached to it, they had it listed as a sleta with an eye. And so we started to do a little bit of research and things. And so it turned out that it was indeed Juana, uh, Juana's work and Isara del Sur Pueblo in origin. So I thought that was to be a very good connection. We connected because we still use the same bowls today. Um, it had that historical feel and traditional clay of the very beautiful El Paso brownware. <laughs> 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 and so it was very important to me to make sure to select her and make that part of this exhibit because I think it tells of our tenacity and our story and the struggle that we have kind of evolved over time. So as a potter, you're taught to be very respectful to Mother Earth, that you do things in proportion, that there's always prayer involved, there's always a serene and, and quiet time because you're asking and you're giving authorities to work through Clay Mother um, and things. And so the fact that she was able to do that and beat her family, have the Pueblo continue, be able to do things um, traditionally with her bowls and things was very important to me. The fact that many years later, I'm able to work with clay and produce the same similar bowl shows that our traditions have continued and been maintained through the course of this time. In addition to this bowl, I selected a second bowl and there should be no photo of it. Um, <laughs> and it was very interesting because um, the secondary bowl was from Isleta Pueblo with an eye. And it was made the exact same time period, had the exact similar characteristics. There's a little bit of difference. Um, and I thought it was important because here the landscape had separated us, time had separated us, yet we were producing the exact similar pottery mm -hmm. hundreds of miles away. And they were used for the exact same purpose and the energies and the respect and the histories that the potters produced to make them and form them um, were identical. And they spoke the same story. And so I selected both. Isleta Pueblo um, made a visit to the vault and through their cultural programs, they removed a lot of items from the catalog for pu public view for religious reasons. And so being respectful that image is not going to be portrayed, um, but it's my write-up was about that pot itself. Mm -hmm. And that pot had a traveling history as well. It was uncovered in the banks of the river in San Juan Pueblo, in Oke And so it had traveled upward, <laughs> as opposed to downward, <laughs> uh, which was very important to us uh, because it there again talks about the travel and things. And so with the Juana Bowl, you know, I don't know its origin or its purpose, but I do know that it tells of our legacy and our traditions and our heritage. And uh, many people's hands have touched and through the course of time. And so it's just a very vivid reminder of how we continue to exist today. It has survived for a reason. And uh, to be able to put her out in public amongst her Pueblo brothers and sisters was important to me because they got to talk and chatter and discuss. Mm -hmm and uh, bring communities together. And so it could have sat, you know, in a, in a museum shelf. It could have sat at the center of a kitchen table. It could have been amongst dignitaries. It could have washed a person. It could have done many different things. Um, but it's here today, and its purpose today is to tell you, all the visitors, about our Pueblo and how 
we have existed. So it's a very strong image of Isleta del Sur Pueblo, of which I'm very mm -hmm. grateful to be able to showcase her with you all today. So in discussing the, the Pueblo diaspora and, and the untold Pueblo stories, like I said at the beginning, there's really no way to encapsulate them all. I think that um, the Pueblo diaspora is, is huge. I remember when I was digging through some records, I found a, a land grant in the Chihuahua, outside of the city of Chihuahua that was given to some Piro people mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the, in the seven, early 1700s. And so we think about all of the different relatives that were displaced during these um, politically contentious points in history and where they end up and um, you know the stories that they carry on. What's unique about our stories is the ways in which there are those um, unbroken lines of, of cultural practice that allow us to connect all the way through time. And I think that, you know, I, I talked a, a, a decent amount about language today as a, as a faculty for cultural expression. And the reason that's so important to me is because when we think about the ways we utilize language, primarily for um, things like prayer or for song, what we're doing is we're taking these, um, these, hu these faculties and connecting ourselves back through time. And so when we think about how, you know, I pray and then my parents prayed and their parents prayed and their parents prayed and so on and so forth, it's a real, um, it's an open door to, to that passageway through time that allows us to um, really understand um, all of the different forces informing who we are today. And so even though that our tribal expression um, currently in Las Cruces um, comes with so many different um, um, historical twists and turns and so many different um, historical events that um, informed who we are one way or another, so many different influences coming to play. There is still that open door that um, allows us to understand what it means to be um, truly from um, the place that we are now. Um, all through time and everybody everybody has a story that has some sort of twist and turn added into it some more so than others but you know all the different ways our timelines merge together and create intricate networks of um, history and of story and of memory um, really allows us to understand why art forms like pottery or weaving or other traditional practices are so important as forms of linguistic communication because they, can, they take what can, can't otherwise be um, expressed um, in, um, they take what, what is otherwise unseen and give it form, right? They, take, they give form to the unseen and I think understanding that, understanding the power of pottery to be a metaphor for these merging of stories and timelines and elements and forces um, is really a testament to what it means to be um, humans with the ability to express these things as well. And so art forms like pottery um, are a real testament to our deeper awareness of what it means to be um, eco-spiritual people. Because if nothing else, um, who we are is in direct relationship to where we are. And in that, it's where we come from, but also where we are going and carrying forward the best practices that have been time tested and suitable for ensuring the most um, 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 I guess the, the best ways in which we can relate to our ecosystem and the best ways in which we can relate to each other. That's what it all comes down to. That's why having these cultural practices is so important because as time filters out all of these different things and time continues in its process, what we move through time with is how we know ourselves to be um, um, a culturally practicing people. And so I think that um, 
telling the story of, on, of the Pueblo diaspora, telling the story of all of these different uh, moments in history that moved us around or um, brought us to different locations is something that is not just, as Jerry expressed, it's not just isolated to these specific um, points or this, this specific region, but it's connected so much further to all of these other histories and stories. And knowing that allows us to really um, see ourselves in the, as in the bigger picture of what it means to, and what our, what our, what our role is as Pueblo people. Um, and while, of course, we all look different from each other, I mean, surprisingly enough, the three of us are related, despite how different <laughs> we look from each other. You know, that's, that's the case for everybody. And so we all have these different ways that um, water, water wrote our poems. And so I think that um, that's why we need to um, look at pottery as such an important teacher and such an important um, example of how the legacy of being people that can pray, people that can express linguistically, people that can create, and people that care why that matters so much. That was a very good summary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I only got lost twice. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep going, you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, with that being said though, we did want to leave enough time for any of the questions that have arisen during this talk because I know there's probably a lot and we want to dedicate enough time to have full well thought answers from each of us or from one of us that you all might want to ask and so I think this is a good transition point to getting into some of the Q&A and we'll have plenty of time to get to fully answer all the questions you all may have. So with that being said, who's first? <laughs> Any? So when it comes to the dates on these pots, we, we didn't date these pots. These were, the, these were the catalog entries that were already existing in the collections, both for SAR and for the Vilcek Foundation. In terms of how those archaeologists date things, I have no idea. I mean, the, the, I, I, the basic process is, you know, they look at um, reference samples. So there's been some pots that have been catalog and carbon dated and, and used as basically points of reference to say like, okay, this plot matches this, it's likely from this time period. And, you know, I have a, I have a um, piece of, I have a, a sandal, um, a yucca sandal that um, the person who dated it, dated it from between like 900 to like 1100, which is like a pretty, it's like what Wikipedia will tell you is like the Pueblo form of it or whatever. It's just like they went on Wikipedia and just dated it based on, on that timeline, but um, I don't know personally too much about the dating process. I don't know if Jerry or Albert have. I any. don't know, but like with the Juana Muniz bowl, when we looked at the information, the province that went with it, it was purchased by a German family, and during that time period, it was traced back to Isleta. So we were able to connect and make sure because during that period is when she was producing her pottery, and so there was a connection, and the catalog took us so far, but then the cultural knowledge of what takes place in your village during that period offered the additional information to make it whole. And so you were able to do that uh, with that. With the bowl that I selected for Asleta, there again, it was uh, an anthropologist who had found it, and he had dated all of this information, and uh, he provided that in the catalog, and it just made the time. So it was part historical, and then it's part knowing some of your histories. That type of did you have anything you want to share? No, go ahead. So do the tribes, like the ones from El Paso, do they visit the ones in New Mexico that like have a meal together, or everybody just separate if I'm from the Well, I'm from El Paso, and I'm kind of mealed out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we share a lot of meals. We do have interactions between one and the other villages and things. And um, Pueblo Times today is, is very important, right? So. Every community 
visits every other community. We have friends, we have relatives, we have interrelational um, interactions with one another. And so, yes, we still have a very unified and, and concise interaction. Um, one Pueblo is known for doing weavings, and so we trade pottery for weavings. Another Pueblo is known for jewelry, and so there's pottery trades for jewelry, and so we still participate in the barter system. But aside from that, we also have some very fe strong family ties as well. And we visit feast day to feast day. Yeah. All the red chilies. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is that friends, families, for feast days we go visit, we spend the day it's not just the dances are 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 spiritual. It's you know it's not just something that you go and you know you you play tourist. These are prayers. These are prayer, prayers to our ancestors, to our deities, our <coughs> spirits, everything that connects us t to the land, to the air, you know, to the water, and everything that walks. So that's the connection. So we go when we attend these feast days and everyone is welcome at ours, which is June 13th, if anyone's free. <laughs> so, you know, you're welcome to come down and pray with us and celebrate with us. Well, what language did you bring? Because... The ancestral language. They were actually up in the upper right hand corner. Yeah, I they, want to go back to those slides. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, One more. There, 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 up there. Where? The far <laughs> corner. Top, top, top left. Top left. Okay. okay. Oh, right. And the next slide, they're also on the top left. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and so those are little like windows or vignettes. That's not like they're like zoomed in on where um, showing highlighting those villages. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Do you do you set up um, formal schools of passing on the pottery um, craft, or is it just more organic by particular families who have been doing it for time at the different pueblos, or is it an intentional school? So, so pottery. Um, the traditional teaching of our of our culture and arts is uh, family based, and so internally each pueblo has its own internal systems of, of passing on the tradition. So my family is a pottery family, and so we pass that down to my niece and my nephew, and it will carry on and so forth. Um, but then we also do communal passage, and so I, I'm part of uh, the Po Center down in Bakke mm -hmm. has very beautiful classes that teach different kinds of uh, techniques and styles and so I happen to be in a class with Jerry and we're learning how to work with Micah which would be a Talos and Pickers style of type pottery making. When we come together we all have our individual ways of producing pottery. The similarity to the process, the respect and all of the attri attributes that go with the cultural practice are uniformly the same but every Pueblo does things a little different. And so um, in this course that we're taking, we're working with mica clay, so we're producing utilitarian ware, which is important because in the Sada del Sur, we produce, you know, the El Paso brownware stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and to piggyback on, uh, on that, oh, before I forget, if anyone's free next Wednesday, I'm doing a pottery demonstration here. So if you want to see how it's done, but, when we go gather, we don't go to Hobby Lobby, Michael's, or whoever. <laughs> as, <laughs> as you know, uh, one young lady asked me when I was doing a demo, asking me where I got my clay, and I told her. She says, "Oh, I just go and you get a 25-pound bag." <laughs> but that commercial clay is not alive. It's not a, doesn't have a spirit. When we gather our clay, we go into the hills, into the streams, the arroyos. We make prayers, we make offerings, we ask forgiveness for cutting into our mother. 
and taking only what we need and doing it in a respectful way and when we're done gathering what we need we cover it up to, to leave no trace, no tracks. We come back, same thing with our, because with our clay we need to add temper, volcanic ash to it so that during the firing process it doesn't explode. Same thing, prayers, offerings, doing it in a good and respectful way with a good heart, letting our clay mother know that what we take is done and, and will be used in a good way and whatever you know, pieces break during the drying process or something. I have several buckets that where pieces broke during the process, drying process and I'm not able to repair them. They're recycled. They go into the next batch. They're always being reused. So nothing goes to waste. So this is part of how we're brought up with that respect of our clay mother that all these things are going to be used in a good and respectful way and our pieces are to be used in the ceremony for serving. They're, they're, they're utilitarian. They're not, nowadays, yes, they go out, you know, work that we do, is, you know, people collect them and put them on shelves, but they're alive, they have a soul, they have a spirit. They need to be out there and spoken to so that they're part of the community, of your household. How are pieces passed on or inherited or how physical objects, generationally, how do you pass them on? Go into your uncle's storage unit and grab <laughs> <laughs> Traveling trailer. There, there, there are some pieces that belong to the family as a whole. And those have no individual ownership. They just belong to the family. And those are maintained. Um, there's traditional aspects that go with those things. Um, there's some pieces, like I'm also a collector. And so in our home, we have about 700 pieces of pottery from different places. And people get to come and visit, interact with them. If you're studying, you can come look at them. Um, we've known them out to museums and those kind of things. Um, so they have a life of its own, but they belong to the community, they belong to the family, and so that's kind of how they're maintained. It's very different um, between mainstream America and, and Native America. It's like, it's very, uh, what belongs to the community is for the community. It, we have a saying, um, you're raised to do for community, then you do for family, and ultimately you do for self. The American way is you do for self, then you do for community. And you might do, you know, <laughs> for value. So, uh, very different concepts. Oh, sorry. Yes, you first, and then this gentleman over here. Yes. Uh, Yolante, I wonder with your leadership, what sort of things you would like people to do to help recognize your people and carry forward your traditions in, in learning to be part of the community and ego spirituality. Thank you, yeah, and I think, you know, coming to talks like this and just, you know, saying hello to us and hearing these histories and engaging more with these stories is the is really the most important part of the work, right? I mean, um, Jerry and I were joking before this presentation, because there's so much more we could have shared. Like, all right, what do we say? What do we not say? And stuff. But a lot of it comes down. Like, most everything we said today is public record. You know, like, I don't think I share anything. <laughs> but you know, and so there's a lot of online resources to just um, really get to know this history better and who we are better. Anything that we share today, um, you can definitely Google and find out so much more about it. And I think starting there and really being aware of this history, for me, is, is the most important thing. Because when it comes to the, the political work, that's where it gets really messy. I, I stay away from that stuff. But um, you know, when it comes to really learning about people, that's how you, you know, honor who they are the best. And that's how you, um, you know, are able to tell people, like, yeah, like, I know about this part of history. I know about these people and um, where they are. And that's, that's how people become 
um, more knowledgeable around these subjects. And so I think definitely, you know, doing what you can to, to research and then learn more. I'm always, I'm always, you know, researching so many different things. There's, I, I've been reading a lot about like, um, you know, medieval her hermeticism, and so like so many times during this conversation, like things like about John Dee and stuff are popping into my head. I'm like, no, don't, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. It's for another conversation. But um, I think it's, you know, like with anything, if you really want to build a better relationship with it, you learn about it. Yeah, and being able to interact with discussions like this. Um, so, as a disclaimer, everything expressed, written, or implied, this is my personal <laughs> viewpoint. But um, these are our perspectives. You might talk to other members from our same village, and they may have a different perspective. And it's just having that understanding and knowledge that our traditions and our histories are oral tradition based. We don't rely on books, we don't rely on all these different things, it's what you're taught at home at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. It's what you're taught ceremonially, it's what you're taught religiously and culturally, and that's who makes us and defines our knowledge um, and what we represent here today. But in interacting with communities, seeing the dances, visiting the pueblos, these kinds of talks, the exhibits, gives you a better insight and understanding to our culture. And it's always um, much better to experience that because at some point you're gonna look at a bowl and it's not just something that's pretty that you put in a shell, it's got a history. And somebody made it. And it originated from a certain place. And certain things happen to be able to form it and give it life. And all of these components, then you look at things a lot differently. And so I encourage you to interact, um, visit, and experience. I have a good question for the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to today, how many of you had heard of our villages? Better than I expected. <laughs> because, seriously, because when uh, I've, and I know from my cousin that when we've done shows, <coughs> demonstrations, uh, you, where, oh, you're, you're, where are you from, Isleta? You don't look into <laughs> uh, Yes, USDA stamp sealed and certified. But it's like, yes, we are Isleta, but we're Isleta with a Y at El Paso. And they, it, there's so much lack of knowledge about the revolt, what happened, and how we ended up being taken down. Not only us, Tiwa, but the uh, villages from the eastern side of the Manzanos, the Pompeos, the, the Piros, P uh, captives from Toa, uh, Mescadero, uh, and um, all, the areas. all the areas that were captured and slowed into slavery to the Spanish were forced down. So these are things that when we do, do advance, do shows, demos, we explain the, that part of history that's totally neglected. Um, it's, it's beautiful to hear you speak about this and for us to be able to learn how to stay open to the voices that are in these exquisite uh, vessels. My question is, will the three of you be going with the show when, the sh when it is in New York and St. Louis and Houston, because I, it, it would be wonderful for others in other parts of the country to be able to hear you talk about this. Yeah, yeah, I plan on going to the New York opening. I, I signed up for that. Yeah, I will be there as well. And I'll probably be heading to the Houston one. So with the exhibit, it's interactive. So all of the artists and participants kind of we as co-curators agreed that we would continue with all the different facets of, of this. And so there's an audio book in the making, so be on the lookout for that. Um, there's a grounded clay a book that's already out and available, and I think I saw that at the it's gift, gift shop. Gift shop here. Yeah, and things that there's a coloring book, there was a PBS special, and so our voices have kind of been heard multiple in different areas. forms and, and, and areas and stuff. And so, it's very important for us to continue with that because we don't want people to just see a pot. 
we want people to experience the relationships we have with our body. And the important, sorry, no, no. the important part of this for me, it's our voices. Mm -hmm. It's our voices telling the story, not an outsider expressing what they think, mm -hmm. but it's what it is, our relationship to these pieces. I think we have time for like one or two more questions. So. Oh, oh wait, right here in the back. Okay. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. Being from the Sleda del Sud in the south, mm -hmm. you have the Sleda South Belt. Have anybody in your pueblo actually made a direct bloodline connection with the relatives in the north? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Curious. Mm -hmm. I have relatives in the Sleda. So. <laughs> we, we had one of our members actually live in this but I she was a very good weaver. Yes. I, I just think people don't realize the ingenuity and the brilliance of the Pueblos and what they did. For example, what do we know about Popo, who actually started the revolt, and some of the ingenious things he did to logistically coordinate everybody so the Spanish would leave? I mean, do we know that much about him? For example, I always heard that what he did is that he tied knots in the rope mm -hmm. and he gave it to all the Pueblos and said, okay, this is when we're all attacking, just undo the knot and this is the time. I mean, this is a brilliant strategy that nobody ever talks about. Mm -hmm. As genius as they, you know, this must have been very, very smart. <laughs> well, he wasn't the only leader. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. He wasn't, but the Spanish had to identify a quote-unquote figurehead. Okay. So, because he was very gifted and very uh, able to articulate, uh, he was quote-unquote given the title leader, but there were multiple leaders from the various villages, and his idea was the court at the knotted cord, and at, at that time of the last knot, then that was the time for the uprising, mm -hmm. except when the runners were going out, uh, the two runners were caught by the Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so the actual date was pushed up. Okay. Yeah, I think that's just a, a real testament to how much more there is to learn about um, New Mexico history and specifically Pueblo history, right? I think it's, it'll do a lot of good to um, incorporate more of these really important moments in time into you know the educational um, curriculum of the schools and stuff so people have a better understanding about how important this stuff really is for shaping you know the cultural landscape of the southwest and beyond and for allowing people to understand where they're living and who they are you mentioned that the ceremonies are done in your ancestral language what are the, are the Pueblos teaching their young people the ancestral language? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in our, when you attend a ceremony and you look at the dances and things, you're going to see elder people and you're going to see youth. And that's a testament as to how our traditions kind of flow and are not going to be forgotten. It's an interactive. And a lot of the teachings take place in individual homes through your families. Um, you learn and things, and then from a public perspective, you get to see it in the plazas during the ceremony. You get to experience it with the arts and uh, the voices that you hear. Is that time? That's time. All right. One, one more. One more. Oh, okay. one, more. One, more. One, more. One, more. one more. There we go. Did your Pueblo people participate in the drafting of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? The Sleda del Sur Pueblo did not participate in that, but we benefited from that document. Because it, when the United States formed the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it established the United States-Mexico boundary using the Rio Grande as the division line, per se. The Rio Grande is an important aspect to our religion and our youth, and so we benefit from that knowledge. In that process, as it was signed, it re-emphasized the land grants that was issued in 1751 by the King of Spain and reinforced the cane that we received as this being our land. And so for Isla del Sur Pueblo, if you look at the leaf in each of the four cardinal directions from the base of the mission step, 
our village extends into Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.